Understanding the subtle differences between radar and optical technology is one of the most important things for either a user or a coach. You can see here that when a radar system is powered on, it is constantly emitting a radar frequency from the radar transmitter. When the club disrupts that signal, the waves reflect back to the receiver, and that's what it uses to take the calculations of the club delivery. When the ball leaves the club face, the radar signal then continues to track the ball as much as it possibly can during its uninterrupted flight. Because the radar is sitting behind, the disruption of those waves will give the software a picture of the basic volume of the golf club. That's why when club geometry changes significantly, that can give us a different calculated reading from the radar launch monitor, even though the face was traveling in the same direction. As you can see here, the angle of attack is taken from the volumetric center of the golf club. The dynamic loft is actually calculated from the launch angle of the golf ball. They use a very complex algorithm that integrates the angle of attack, club head speed, and launch of the ball in order to calculate the dynamic loft at the impact point. It is important to be aware that the angle of attack is calculated from the volumetric center and the dynamic loft is calculated from the club face. So these are being calculated from different points on the golf club. The face angle calculated by radar follows the same process as dynamic loft. Whereas the foresight tells us exactly where the face plane is oriented, the radar is only capable of telling us the calculated face angle of the impact point. This is very important when we're dealing with the curved face clubs such as the driver, fairway woods, and hybrids. When most golfers look at a face angle reading on a launch monitor, they naturally assume that's where the sweet spot was oriented. But this animation can clearly show you how that can be very misleading with a radar launch monitor. The high speed cameras of the GC Quad are used to characterize the 3D location of each individual fiducial that is placed on the club face. The fiducials are placed on a club face in accordance with the way the software was designed. Their individual placement and relational placement is critical for maximizing the accuracy of the data. When we connect the center toe and heel fiducial, that's what causes the vertical center to be formed. Any shot that is struck above that vertical center will be denoted as positive or high on the face and anything struck below will be denoted as negative or low on the face. The midpoint between those heel toe fiducials is what causes the horizontal center. And that's what helps us determine whether the ball is struck on the toe or the heel. Together, the horizontal and vertical center combine to form the center face projection, or what most golfers typically call the sweet spot. As the club is on approach towards the GC quad, the software triangulates the location of each of those fiducials and creates a face plane. That's what is able to give us the large variety of measured club data. We can see here as this tilts back, that 3D reading of the fiducials will change and gives us the opportunity to measure loft. This rotation is what gives us measured face angle, and this is what's going to give us change in lie angle. Now, as we get through this, I want to do a quick review about Foresight's core technology, and that's stereoscopic vision. Stereoscopic vision is the term used to refer to when you have a single object that is being tracked by, let's say, two eyes, or, you know, in Foresight's case here with the GC2, two cameras. And of course that technology has since evolved and it now 
is in the GC quad and the GC hop. In order to get the best possible information from the club tracking cameras, we need to make sure that we apply the fiducials in the way they are designed. And that's to have them here, you know, we want them in between grooves six and seven on a standardized size iron head. And this is what's gonna accurately define both my vertical and my horizontal centers that are gonna be used for a lot of the impact point measurement, but it's also gonna make sure that I have consistent data from day to day and client to client. One of the things that we've started doing within the last two years as the prevalence of asymmetrical driver faces really kind of grown is we started to pull these fiducials in a little bit closer to the striking area on the club face. And what that does is help eliminate, let's say some of the twist from the twist face and give us a little bit better characterization of what's happening in that center portion of the golf club. Now, I think this is a really neat image most of you have probably never seen. And I love this because it really shows us that the cameras do not track the club head, they track the fiducials. And I hope this reinforces how important these locations are because it's their placement that's going to cause the mechanism for how the club data is going to be measured and presented within the software. Now this is one of my all-time favorite images. You know, like most people, you know, when I first got an optical launch monitor and they told me that the spherical correlation capabilities it had meant I didn't have to mark the golf balls like I did with my old vector, yeah, it was, I mean, I was excited, but it was a little hard to believe. But when I finally got my eyes onto this image, this is a golf ball passing through the launch window that's tracked by just one single camera in the GC quad. So you can imagine the volume of information that comes if they've got the other three cameras tracking as they usually do. Just, you know, the ability to read how clear the resolution is on Titleist and even just see each individual dimple was a real eye opener to me. In fact, one of my favorite questions that I would ask in seminar is this fade or draw. You know, there's usually a few different answers, but most of the room would say draw and say, well, maybe, but I hope you considered checking that it is a right-handed club where we can see those toe markers, the heel marker, and that's what confirms that, yes, in fact, it is a draw. You know, that, that resolution on the Titleist logo allows us with the naked eye to see the leftward axis tilt, but that's only a draw if it's hit by a righty. Now, in comparison, here's a view of the raw data capture that comes from TrackMan. And I'll just try and explain this through you. It's pretty similar to what we see with all the radar devices, but going up this side here, we've got velocity and time. And so this first disturbance here going through this area, this is actually you know, the club. And that's you know, when it disturbs that radar signal that's being emitted from the box. And higher up here on the velocity curve, that's the toe. We know it's going faster. And this is the heel. We know it's going faster. Now, when we go over here, post-impact, impact is defined by this line. We see this little blank space in here and then the ball takes off. And it's interesting because this top end of the ball disturbance apparently has a higher velocity than this bottom end. And right in here we see a little break in time and we see a little break in time. And that's where I like to think of this as the collision. You know, and the, the collision's messy, it's like a car crash. And just after that collision, you know, the ball reappears. And so the software is gonna take when it first picks up the ball and it's gonna take the first deceleration that it's able to track of the head. And from there, it's going to do the best job it can to estimate this impact time. And that's when the club calculations are gonna be presented for. And of course, we can see down here, post impact, we get some disturbance from the shaft and you can see the club moving out on exit. So let's get into the most sought after data by the worldwide attendees for peak level one. And that's outdoor comparison testing between GC Quad and TrackMan 4. 
So in order to set up this test for foresight, I had the guys from the lab here, we've got Graham and Carson go out and build this full grid, you know, what we call grid and pole testing. And so what that means is that we can actually go ahead and we'll put someone downrange, like right here, and they'll go stand wherever that ball lands, and they're going to laser right back to the center line. So they get the offline distance, and then they're going to laser right back to where the golfer struck the ball so they get the downrange distance. And in order to calibrate the systems as best we could, you can see here in this bottom left image, we overlaid the TrackMan target line directly on top of our GC quad alignment stick. And we also went so far as to set that up in front of the uh, downrange target camera on the TrackMan. We wanted to just try and eliminate any parallax, any potential set, uh, source of error just to get the best possible data and here's what we got so within this chart you can see we've got the carry distance as calculated by the GC quad and we've got the variance of that calculation from what was measured by our Bushnell laser rangefinder if we go over here we can see TrackMan's normalized calculation and TrackMan's downrange measurement. And we go all the way down the list and we get some pretty interesting insights. We take a look here, we see that the GC quad on average over 30 shots was within 1.5% carry distance at 150 yards of the Bushnell laser. And we take a look at the TrackMan, we see that it was within 1.1. So and that tells me that, you know, there's 0.4% variance between the accuracy levels of these two systems in this one isolated test. And then when I go and I actually cross-reference the level of accuracy of the Bushnell laser, that variance is smaller than the, to than the tolerance on the laser. And combine that with the fact that, I mean, my golfers aren't accurate to 1.5 or 1.1%. And this is really what just gave me great confidence, regardless of the environment, that I was getting great data indoors and out. And the next thing we wanted to do was, of course, indoor testing. So we went ahead and set up the TrackMan unit to the manufacturer specs of distance from the ball. And of course, we did the best possible job we could in matching the target camera for the TrackMan and the alignment rod for the GC quad. And then of course we just went ahead and started to hit a bunch of shots. And here's what we got. So we've got the TrackMan data here on the left and we've got the Foresight data here on the right. And I really want to draw your attention down to this example because I think it explains a lot about the differences between how the two systems operate in the indoor environment. So right here, I've got a face to path of 0 0.1. So that means TrackMan's calculation is the face angle at impact point was 0 0.1 degrees to the right or open of the direction the club head was traveling in. Now when we contrast this with the face to path measurement taken by our GC quad, we can see that the sweet spot orientation or the center face projection was actually 3.9 degrees to the left of the direction the club path was traveling. And that's a huge difference. And the reason for that big difference is because of the way the systems work. Now this shows me that the ball was struck nine millimeters to the toe. If it struck nine millimeters to the toe, that curvature on the club face effectively opens the club face to compensate for the gear effect. Over here, the, with TrackMan, their face-to-path calculation of 0 0.1 open went into their ball flight calculation, which was to have a 0 0.2 degree axis tilt with the ball starting 3.1 degrees to the right of the target line. Okay. When we look over here, you can see our system calibration was out by about a degree because we didn't get the exact same start direction. But with independent club and ball measurement, not having the two rely on each other for calculations, 
that gear effect on the toe strike was accurately measured with a 17 degree leftward tilt angle which resulted in the driver hooking 22 yards left of the target as opposed to this calculation showing that the driver ended up 14.5 degrees right of the target. Now for anyone out there that takes their golf seriously, whether you're a player or a coach, it is so critically important that you understand how and why this works. That's why we're taking the time to go through it with you.